I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and info that empowers you with knowledge so you can make better financial decisions in your life. So today, I'm going to talk about two topics that are in the news right now. The stock market, and of course, this time of year, taxes. First, I want to talk about the current investment environment. And later, how much do you know about being able to file, prepare and file your taxes for free? I'm going to talk about the options with you. Right now, though, I want to talk about the investment environment. So the stock market has been through, as it always is, like a roller coaster ride, and has been bumping up recently various days at record highs. And so what happens is people become so uh, optimistic and think, because of what's known as recency bias, that whatever the market has done recently, that's what it's going to do going forward. The reality is U.S. stocks are priced really high. Could they go higher for months or years forward? Sure. I mean, not straight line. It's the roller coaster ride up and down based on different conditions. But the reality is values are very pricey because we've had this period of time that we now have falling inflation and surprisingly strong economic activity that nobody expected. And then the question is, well, what could go wrong? Who knows? You could come up with a list, what I call the wall of worry, not my original phrase, of all the things that could go wrong in the world or in the United States. So my thing is slow and steady wins the race. There's a guy who's retired, semi-retired, whatever, Jason Schweig, who has written about Wall Street forever. And he decided, I guess, in semi-retirement or retirement, to take months off from paying any attention at all to financial markets. Didn't read any news, didn't follow what his holdings were, nothing. And then he looked months later, he's like, oh, wow. Okay, so things are all right. The whole idea is that he had has a diversified portfolio, and Jason's just letting that portfolio ride for the long haul. But what so many of us do is we get caught up in the energy of the moment with investing. And we react as a result emotionally, putting money in, taking money out, whatever, chasing the hot stocks, whatever it is. My thing, and anyone who's listened to me over the decades knows that when people are really focused on this with a lot of anxiety is when the market, for whatever reason, overall is having a big decline, that in those circumstances, you always hear me say, what game are you playing? Are you playing a long game? Are you playing a short game? Are you diversified? Do you have your money spread out across various types of investments? And I remember uh, in times where we've had these huge market declines in very short order, like we had uh, 16, 17 years ago, there was a lot of panic selling. And people went to the sidelines and waited till things were safe. Well, by the time people had confidence to get back in again, they had missed not only the decline, but they missed a lot of the recovery and baked in permanent reduced returns by having gone to the sidelines. My thing today I will tell you that I believe that 
markets from here are more likely to have less return moving forward. Didn't hear me say no return. Less return because of the big gains we've had of late. So what do I do? What I do is everything for me is diversification. So what do I own a lot of that most people don't? I'm not advising you to do this. I'm just talking about the concept of being well diversified. Domestically, I love total stock market index because I own little pieces of American capitalism from the largest enterprises to many of the smallest publicly traded enterprises, thousands of stocks. I want to ride with American capitalism. But there's something else I do most Americans are not comfortable doing. And that is, I own international funds, international index. Why? Because a lot of foreign entities, a lot of foreign countries are going to have more economic growth moving forward than we will because they're going from a smaller base, a lower income base. There's more room for economic activity, for economic growth in less developed economies and also being diversified with economies overseas. That's my thing. I'm not saying it should be your thing. What I'm saying should be your thing is it's a big mistake to try to time the market and a big mistake to try to have concentrated bets where you're saying, oh, I want to hit the big score, so I'm going to go in blah, 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 because that's the next Microsoft or the next Apple or the next Google or the next, uh, what do they call Facebook now, Meta, whatever, that, that, you know, that people want to be in the next whatever that's going to hit not a home run, not even a grand slam home run, but way beyond that, be the New York Yankees in their prime or what the Kansas City Chiefs are trying to become. Anyway, the point for you that I'd like to make is the news of the day is not how you should decide to buy or sell. The tip you get from somebody in the bar or wherever that's not how you should decide to stake your game for the future. That really, for most of us, unless this is what you do every day, all day long, as your job, is widely diversified. Now, I found out recently, my teenage son owns crypto and has a crypto wallet. I didn't know that, Krista. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Does your son, is the same age, have a crypto wallet? I don't think so. He doesn't have enough money to create one. Well, <laughs> so, so I'm asking Grant, not passing any judgment, I'm just asking him, trying to get him to explain. And it's all about this mentality, there's going to be this big score. Mm -hmm. And that is such a natural human thing. Why do people line up? when they're doing those uh, big gamey, powerball -y thingies, when the jackpot gets to be one billion whatevers or 800 million whatevers. And I'll tell you why I call them whatevers in a second. Anyway, um, it's all about us trying to do a shortcut in life. And my son will figure it out, he's a smart kid. But ultimately, you do the basic blocking and tackling. You live on less than what you make, you save money, and you invest money for the long term, intermediate term, and save for the short term. I'm dull. I am dull as dishwater. But the idea is I want to be able to have financial security long term, and that's how you do it. And, you know, we all make mistakes. I bought, I remember, I mean, how many years, 20-some years ago, $500 worth of web, web van 
Remember Webvan? Oh, do I remember Webvan? I used to love getting our groceries so that way. I was so excited about Webvan. They were way ahead of their time. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I lost that money. And, you know, it doesn't sound like it wasn't, you know, it felt like a lot to me back then. It was not, I knew I could lose it, but I really hoped I'd have a big score and I got nothing out of it. And I remember it. It sticks in your head when something like that happens. So, so I remember... Um, in my TV work, I went out and, and I went to a web van warehouse and I was mm -hmm. filming how they, um, filming, taping, can't yeah. see those words for digitizing, <laughs> whatever we were back then we were filming the, the web van warehouse and we'd see how, uh, an order would come in over a computer and how the robots would come and grab the stuff and it would go in the colored baskets and they'd go down the line and they'd go right to the delivery van that was going to take the refrigerated frozen and room temperature items and I was just absolutely blown away I thought this was going to be the future and all that and truth is every one of us who ever got a delivery from web van we can thank the stockholders <laughs> who lost all their billions in web van you're welcome for my tiny contribution yeah for making it possible for us to get groceries delivered at a cheaper price than we could buy them at a traditional supermarket. There were a lot of things like that. So there's nothing wrong with doing Explore, mm -hmm. where you you take some money and it's your Vegas money. And right. you throw it into a stock. But you have to start with what Chuck Schwab always called the core, where you build your portfolio that is your everyday portfolio spread across the markets and that's what it's about now i i said about the lottery tickets i was going to say what do i mean about thingies well because they always say uh you know 800 million dollars to one person and later you find out they got a fraction of that because instead of that 800 million is paid over 20 25 30 years whatever uh before tax and all that so what somebody actually gets is still a lot of money it's just not what you see on the electronic billboards as you drive around the nation's freeways. Right. Got to be in it to win it, though. Okay, John in Ohio says, Oh, my goodness. I know. Oh, For you're <laughs> killing me. I mean. So every time those big jackpots happen, you go I and buy I actually don't. It. I don't, but I used to do a pool here at work, and I was like, why not? I'd throw a dollar in. I mean, you know, if it's play money. John in Ohio says, Forgive me, Clark. I have sinned against saving. I applied for and am keeping my Amex Aspire card. Yes, it's an outrageous $555 annual fee, but my wife and I like the diamond perks. This is a Hilton card or Hi Hilton? I think it is. It, keeping that level requires 30 stays a year. Yeah, Hilton. 30 stays a year, which would cost me around $5,000 to keep it. We like the Hilton chain. We do have other cash back cards and we never carry balances. I hope you understand or will try to give me better guidance. So John... If you are loyal to a particular chain, you're loyal to Marriott, you're loyal to Hyatt, Hilton, uh, IHG, International Hotel Group, you're loyal to one of the big hotel chains, in your case, Hilton, and you stay at their brandeds, and you're getting the perks promised, then it's fine. The big thing I'm reading on the frequent flyer, frequent traveler blogs, is that the uh, hotel locations are not honoring the high-level status perks with the upgrades, the free meals, the free drinks, all those things. So if you're finding that Hilton is, in fact, honoring all those things and they're really valuable to you, I mean, it's nice to pay for the cheapest room in a hotel and get a fancy presidential suite or governor's suite or whatever. So if it's working for you, do it. Jeff Neal in Pennsylvania says, Clark, I'm teaching my kids 13, 11, and 7 about banking, savings, and investing. Right now, I have each of them set up with a traditional youth savings account at a local bank. It's been a great experience for them so far, but it bothers me that they're only getting one cent a month rather than learning the value of real interest. Which is more valuable for them to learn, local banking or higher interest through an online bank? Any suggestions on high-yield accounts that, they, that are kid-friendly? Thanks. We are big fans here. So, uh, Jeff Neal, here's the deal. All right. So, kids today don't value the physical branches. They don't value everything is electronic to them. It's online. Uh, kids from very young 
are able to pick up a tablet or an iPad and do things on it. They don't think about having to have that physical facility. And you shouldn't either for them, for the younger ones. I think they will do just fine with an online bank where they're going to earn so much more on the money that is in the savings than they are from a physical bank branch that's ripping them off. For the 13-year-old, and when the 11-year-old turns 13, I want you to go a different path. I'd like you to take them to a physical Fidelity Investments branch and open a teen investment account and use it as an opportunity because you only need $1 to establish that investment relationship with Fidelity. And you want a kid to really get the concepts like what I was talking about at the top about being able to do a total stock market index fund or something like that. Fidelity has done the best job I know of of any bank or investment organization in the United States creating a learning lab and a real investment opportunity for teenagers to learn investing and learn the idea of the waterfront kind of investing. Because Fidelity has the zero funds that have zero commissions and zero ongoing expenses that are a great learning laboratory for your 13-year-old and two years from now for your 11-year-old. David in Ohio says, have you heard about using an archive pen to prevent check washing? Nail polish remover doesn't work to wash the amount and pay payee off of a check. The Uniball 207 is an archive pen that is available in many places. I still need to write checks and mail them out, and this pen keeps my checks from being mod modified fraudulently. This is a great suggestion. There are a number of pens that when you go to, if you went to those things called office supply stores, mm -hmm. there aren't that many Office Depot, Office Max Staples anymore, local ones, you will see pens that are marked that are, in fact, uh, safe from being washed. And this is a great idea because the problem of checks being stolen in the mail, the payee washed, whoever you're paying not getting paid, somebody you didn't want to pay stealing money from you, changing the payee and the amounts, and then you trying to clean up the mess later. Uh, the best first rule is don't write checks and mail them, period. Um, I've had two checks stolen in the mail over the last, lost or stolen in the mail, over the last two months. One a month. In each case, they were sent by the bill pay service I use. So thank goodness the checks don't have my account information on the bottom. They have routing numbers that are only clear to the bill pay service. And this is a terrible problem with the checks being stolen in the mail. Um, there is not a way for the Postal Service, it seems, to secure these. So if you can avoid writing a check, pay electronically to anybody you can. And most organizations you pay, it will go truly electronic one to another. You should be fine. But if you must write a check and you must mail it, then use one of these pens that make it difficult, if not impossible, for a criminal to wash the ink. So coming up ahead, we're going to talk about something just as unpleasant as somebody stealing your check, washing it, and then using that as a path to steal your money, having to pay taxes. So we're going to talk about ways for you to file your taxes where you have to pay your taxes, but at least you don't have to pay to prepare them and file them. So there's a federal program that roughly, uh, depending on the year, somewhere around two-thirds to 70% of taxpayers are eligible for that only 3% ever use. People just don't even know that the IRS, for many, many years, has had a free program to file your income tax called Free File. And all you do is you go to irs.gov, you click on the Free File link, and you see whether or not there's a tax prep firm that's participating that you're eligible to use under free file. 
So the adjusted gross income you have to have is below 79000 and that's roughly two-thirds to, again, somewhere around 70% of taxpayers qualify for it. And you're using traditional tax prep software but not having to pay for it. If you live in a state with a state income tax, some of the participants also include free state tax preparation and filing. If you live in a state without state income tax, good for you, because you don't have to worry about the paperwork or paying the income tax. But these free filing options are the real deal, and people just don't know that they're out there. Again, free file. You go to irs.gov, you look for the free file logo, click on it, and check out your eligibility and which ones are okay for you. That's number one. Number two, the IRS this year has a new program that is a pilot that is called Direct File. And it's funny it's a pilot because we are the last developed country on earth that has a tax system where you can't have the taxing authority send you a proposed return that you can either accept or reject. Uh, we don't, we've never done that in the US, so this is an intermediate step direct file, and not all taxpayers are eligible to use it. It depends on what state you live in and the complexity of your tax return because it is an early pilot that hopefully in a few years will be commonplace like it is everywhere else. If you have to pay taxes, why should you have to go through the hassle and the expense of hiring a software program or someone to do the filing for you? So what states are you eligible? I'm glad you asked because many of them are the most populous states in the country. California, Florida, let's see, what other, uh, New York, Texas, I think those are the four most populous states in the U.S. Where else? Arizona, Massachusetts, Nevada, New Hampshire, South Dakota, Tennessee, Washington, and Wyoming. All right, now one pattern there is not all the states, but most of the states that the IRS is offering direct file or states without a state income tax. Again, you win so many different ways if you live in a state without a state income tax. And may I digress to say, one of the things I'm really happy about is that states all across America are reducing their state income taxes and going away from taxing income to taxing consumption. And why does that excite me? because I believe so much that you create additional economic growth activity, not states racing to the bottom, as people who love a state income tax will say, that you deprive people of services when states cut income tax. The reality is what happens is that you create long-term more economic activity when you encourage people to save money rather than encourage them to spend money. So when you tax consumption, you change behavior, not all at once, but over time, in citizens. And that's why I've always been a fan of taxes that tax us on what we spend, rather than taxes that tax us on what we earn. The address you go to to be unhappy with me about that is every time I say it, People get unhappy. Clark.com slash Clark stinks. Krista? Tom in Georgia says, I recall you're advising us to keep our tax records forever or for at least seven years. In the news, I learned of a fellow who couldn't be prosecuted for not paying his taxes because the statute of limitations runs out after five years. I thought if you were found cheating, the IRS could look back at least seven years or more. Have the laws changed? What am I missing? Thank you for all the information. You've saved me so much money and much aggravation. Thank you. And this is an area that confuses people no end. Depending on the circumstance, the safest number to go with is 10 years. 
they're depending on the the facts of your individual tax situation the irs may be able to come after you for up to 10 years for not having paid tax so yeah i guess you could say past 10 years i'm overkill keeping my returns and i have my returns back to the 1970s or early 80s wow. i forget which just the returns themselves not the supporting documentation past seven years but um i you know it's really important that if the irs does come calling that you show that you have kept good and complete records because it changes the psychology of what you're undergoing in whatever review or audit they're doing Ben in Michigan says, how can listeners like my fiance and I set up a tax plan for each year? We are combining assets now and are getting married in early 2025. Congratulations Congrats. to you. We're mid-30s dinks, uh, which is... Dual income, no kids. Yep. With combined income just above 200K. We want to fully understand how to support a special needs sibling, deal with elder care, help nibblings get educated, and establish savings plan for a family, navigate career opportunities, and handle large purchases and expenses like our upcoming wedding. We also want to avoid mistakes like the, last, like the time I sold my home after 22 months of ownership, causing thousands in taxes oh. I wouldn't have had to pay if I'd waited two more months. Ouch. Instead of the default tax strategy of close your eyes, plug your ears, and hum loudly until April. We'd like to start every year with a savings, investing, spending plan that accounts for taxes before decisions are made. The ideal solution is finding a non-commissioned professional who can meet with us quarterly to answer questions, revise our plan, and even prepare our taxes. We tried two fiduciaries already, but they said they can't help us in the way that we need. Yeah, so obviously getting burned on the tax thing, that's really front and center with you. And at your income, you would really benefit from having an ongoing relationship with a CPA, Certified Public Accountant, who does tax work. That that's what he or she does. And having a CPA, CPAs will tell you do tax, as would an enrolled agent. I wish my clients would ask me questions during the current year instead of me having to break the bad news to them after when we're doing their taxes, well, if you would have asked us this, we could have told you blah, blah, blah. So exactly what you're thinking, having some clock time with a CPA who does tax would be great. Now, you approach two fiduciaries who could not help you with the very specific tax-oriented questions you had. But at the time the two of you are combining your lives and have the plans going forward, it would be a great time for you to look at sitting down with a fee-only fiduciary. And I have a couple of links available at Clark.com. In addition to Garrett that I've talked about in the past, there's also AdviceOnlyNetwork.com and there is FlatFeeAdvisors.org. Uh, these organizations offer a variety of uh, fiduciaries who either will give you spot advice or quarterly advice like you're talking about or expect to be able to give you ongoing advice and you become their customer over time. So uh, try those two organizations as well in addition to wherever you tried to contact a fiduciary before. Because this would be a good time for you to have a financial household checkup in addition to you getting a CPA who does tax. Lewis in North Carolina says, My wife and I, along with our 13 and 15-year-old daughters, are planning a trip to Tokyo in the fall of 2025, and we would like some wow. advice on when to start buying the plane tickets and booking the hotel rooms. Any tips and tricks on what to look for to make our trip more pleasant would be much appreciated. And All we've right. had so many questions about people planning trips to Australia, different places. When do they look for tickets? Yeah. It's the biggest one. All right. So uh, first, I'm so impressed because I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow usually. But you are going to Tokyo this year, right? I am going to Tokyo, which my timing is so unfortunate because... 
Japan is in, in, in right now. It's like just about as in as any foreign destination from the United States could be. And I've been to uh, Japan three times before, and I am blown away how, for example, how much more expensive hotels are looking for my trip this year versus in the past. So uh, for 25, hopefully, when you're looking uh, more than a year and a half from now, the, the intense interest in travel to Japan may have hopefully softened some. As far as when you want to be looking at those tickets, you're going to hate me. I'm going to tell you, you don't want to be looking till maybe uh, three to five months before your travel in fall of next year. Now, you could, starting in December, set up a fare alert tracking the fares to Japan um, on Google Flights or Hopper or any of the good airfare search engines. Um, if you use Kayak, be very wary of a lot of these UFO ticketing sites that'll list these really cheap fares and then you go read reviews about those ticketing sites and you're like, oh man, oh man, these people are a problem. So set up your alerts, give it some time, and the trends with fares are amazing. Like um, my niece called me the other day and she and her husband bought a deal to Australia because there was a, a sale to Australia for $9.99 round trip. So they just bought it and they're going. And, and she followed my rule. You know, she saw the deal, bought it, and now she's trying to figure out what she's going to do there that when the opportunistic bargains pop up, boom. And as an example, when you get into uh, late this year, you set up that fair alert on the various sites, they'll give you predictive analysis. What, you know, is this a low fare by historical numbers you're seeing right now, a high fare in between? And what green means go usually. If it's lower than normal, you can certainly consider buying that fare. Um, in Japan, you want to look at buying a Japan Rail Pass. Usually the best deals, although now you used to not be able to, you can buy a Japan Rail Pass when you get there. Usually it's cheaper to buy one before you go in the United States. You can read a lot about that. There are a lot of suggested itineraries. Most Americans do what most foreigners do who come to the United States. They go to New York and Los Angeles and skip everywhere else in the country. Uh, in Japan, people tend to go to the Tokyo metro area and maybe Kyoto, and that's it. There's a lot more to Japan. Take time reading suggested travel itineraries for five, seven, 10, 14 day trips to get a sense about where you should build out your itinerary. And as for me, I have zero interest in being authentic, sleeping on one of those mats. You tried that in Japan, didn't you? Yes, uh, we stayed in a Ryokan. Oh, I am not sleeping on the floor on one of those mats. How was your night's sleep on that, Krista? It wasn't great, I'm not gonna lie. No. No, I mean, we're spoiled. We're used to a good mattress. Go to a hotel that has a good mattress. If you must have the authentic experience, put a mat on the floor, have somebody take your picture on it, and then get back in the bed. And that night, we, we were in Kyoto. You were in a hotel room that was like the tiniest hotel room you've ever stayed in, I remember. 70 square feet. It was 70 square feet. I walked it off. And it was uh, roughly 10 by 7. In that 10 by 7, it had a small bed, a TV coming out of the ceiling, had a safe that was coming out of the wall, <laughs> and had a bathroom that was the size of an airplane bathroom that the shower, the toilet, and the sink were all one terrible unit. Yeah. And I remember when we, was cheap. <laughs> we landed in Tokyo. That was a staff trip. Um, you immediately found the McDonald's. Well, I was hungry. You always do that. <laughs> Wherever we are in the world. I have managed to go to McDonald's in uh, South America, Australia, Asia, North America, 
and Europe. Did I miss any continents? Do they have Antarctica? a McDonald's in Antarctica? <laughs> they don't have McDonald's yet in Antarctica. Yet, oh gosh. <laughs> yet, give them time. Because McDonald's is going through an absolute boom time right yeah. now. Do you know that McDonald's I did not. is doing like the best it's done in forever. And it's funny because their customer satisfaction scores are still like just about the worst of any national chain. But they're doing really well these days. Um, that's trivia about nothing. Um, but here's something that is not trivia about nothing. You know how there's a day for everything? Today is National Unclaimed Property Day. So what this is about is so many of us, or family or friends, will have accounts we lost track of. And we have a guide at Clark.com where you can search for money in your name, family member's name, a friend's name. And the more unusual your last name is, the easier it is for you to find money that is yours that's gone unclaimed from who knows how, who knows where. If you have a very common name, not as easy, but worth going on the hunt. You have very simple paperwork usually to do, but they will always require, I think without exception, a copy of your social security card or number. Don't be nervous about that. It's a necessary step of the process to be reunited with your money and don't pay any service to be reunited with your money. You can do it for free. You'll see how to do that on our guide at Clark.com. And yes, there is a day for everything over the course of the calendar. And have an absolutely wonderful day. Remember what we're about, you learning ways to save more and spend less and avoid getting ripped off.